Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Angela Greiling Keen. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg News and the 106th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through events such as this while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit press.org backslash institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker today and those of you in the audience. Our head table includes guests of our speaker as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, I'd note that members of the general public are also attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. You can, follow, you can follow the action today on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a question and answer period. I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guests. I'd ask each of you to stand briefly as your name is announced. Rodrigo Valderrama, a communicator member of the National Press Club. Wen Yen graduate journalism student at the University of Missouri. Peter Stanton, president and CEO of Stanton Communications. Constanza Sea, international press advisor for Chile. Sean Lingus, reporter with Smart Grid Today. His Excellency, Alvaro Hanna, vice minister of trade for Chile. Skipping over the podium, Allison Fitzgerald, Project Manager for Financial and State News for the Center for Public Integrity and the Chair of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Skipping over our speaker briefly, Tommy Burr, Washington Correspondent with the Salt Lake Tribune and the Chairman of the National Press Club's Board. His Excellency Felipe Bulnes, Chile's Ambassador to the U.S. Daniel Macy, an editor with Thompson Media Group. Connie Lawn, Washington correspondent with IRN USA. Ailita, Eileen Roberta Schleff with Creative Alliance Communications and a reporter with Hispanic League. <laughs> Many Americans will recall the face of our guest today from the television coverage of his country's dramatic rescue of 33 minors in 2010. Chilean President Sebastián Piñera, who had been in office only seven months at the time, rallied his country, business interests, and the help of other nations to bring the trapped miners safely to the surface after 70 days deep underground in the Atacama Desert. That was a huge triumph for the new president, who was the first conservative elected to lead Chile since former dictator Augusto Pinochet was ousted more than 20 years ago. Chile's GDP expanded 5.6% last year as foreign investments in the mining industry helped fuel a boom in consumer spending. Despite economic growth, Mr. Piñera's presidency has faced controversy. Protests in the southern part of Chile against rising natural gas prices stranded thousands of tourists in 2011, and students demonstrated for months in 2011 and 2012 seeking more public investment in education. At least two of his cabinet members have resigned as a result. But the presidency is only the latest challenge Mr. Pineda has taken on. His business ventures had already made him a billionaire and one of Chile's richest citizens. His interests are varied to say the least. Mr. Pineda founded the company that first introduced credit cards into Chile's economy. Since that, he has owned stakes in LAN, Chile's largest airline, a television station, and in Colo Colo, his country's most popular soccer team. Forbes magazine estimates his fortune at 2.2 billion US dollars. <laughs> Underestimated, he says. <laughs> he also has spent much of that fortune to preserve the rainforests on the island of Chiloé. And when he wants to see it, he can pilot his own helicopter over the park, although we're not sure as president whether he's allowed to take the controls. Mr. Pineda, here in Washington yesterday, met with Secretary of State John Kerry to discuss U.S.-Chile relations, and he joins us today fresh from a talk with President Obama about trade agreements. Please help me give a warm National Press Club welcome to President Sebastián Pineda.
Good afternoon, Mr. Tommy Burr, President or Chairman of the Board of the Press Club, members of this club, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we are just coming from a meeting with President Obama, which was a very fruitful and useful one. We discussed many issues. First of all, the relationship between Chile and the U.S. We have had a very long and friendly relationship with the U.S. We signed a free trade agreement in 2004, and since then, we have been able to more than triple our trade with the U.S. Actually, today our trade is um, accounts of a figure close to $3,000 billion, and therefore $3 billion. And uh, we have a huge challenge to double or triple it again. And it's not only trade of goods and services. We also have very strong relationship in terms of uh, energy, education, science, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship. And we are working very hard together with the US in trying to promote the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would be an alliance of 11, maybe 12 countries, Japan jumps in, that will become the largest free trade zone in the world. And uh, we are very committed with the U.S. to push that agreement forward. And our timetable, which was established a year ago, was that before the next APEC meeting that will take place in Bali in October of this year, we should have that agreement or should have made great progress towards that agreement. We also discuss, of course, the situation of the U.S., Europe, the Asian giants, and we discuss the situation of Latin America. Of course, in Latin America, there are different views, different visions. On the one hand, you have countries like Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Chile, maybe others, which have a very common view of the world, and we share the same values with the U.S. We are fully committed with democracy, human rights, rule of law, separation of power, freedom of press, which is something extremely important for you and for everybody else. And we have created the Pacific Alliance, which is a very young alliance, but has been extremely successful. We have already reached agreements in order to liberalize our tariff, to integrate our financial sectors, to uh, create free movement of people around all these countries, and a lot of uh, collaboration in terms of education, scholarships, and we are joining forces to penetrate the Asian markets, which is a big challenge that both the U.S. and us have in front of us. But on the other hand, you have the ALBA countries, which are following a different path. They understand democracy in a different way. Their economic development model is different from ours. And of course, each country has the right to choose its own path. But we are fully convinced that at least for Chile and the Pacific Alliance country, the path that we are following is the right one. Actually, the countries that have created the Pacific Alliance are by far the fastest growing countries in Latin America. And therefore, we are following this path because in Chile, we have to, to face two big challenges in the last 25, 30 years. The first one has already been done, and it was accomplished in a very successful way, was the transition from a military government that took place in Chile for 17 years and to a, a, democrat, a democratic government. Normally, these transitions take place in the middle of political crisis, economic chaos, social riots. That was not the case of Chile. We did it in a very peaceful and wise way because we reached an agreement on how to do that transition. And maybe that's why Chile has, uh, since then, performed so well. But now we are facing a second transition, which is harder, and at the same time, a, a very motivating one, which is to transform Chile, which was the poorest Spanish colony, into the first Latin American developed country without poverty and with a better a distribution of income and, and, and more equality of opportunities. And that's a challenge when, with which we are committed right now. For that, we will need to, de to do things much better than in the past. That's why when we came to power or to government three years ago, 
we knew that we were going to face big troubles and big problems and big challenges. First of all, we knew that the international economy was going through a very deep uh, crisis. Europe today is in recession. The U.S. recovery has not been as strong as it used to be in the past. The Asian giants are losing momentum, and in many Latin American countries, they are losing their capacity to grow. So for us, the first target was to, of course, to deal with this international crisis without affecting our capacity to duplicate our rate of growth and to duplicate our job creation capacity. And that was the first difficulty. The second difficulty is 11 days before we came to office, Chile was hit by one of the worst, the fifth worst earthquake and tsunami in the history of mankind, which was a devastating one. In a few minutes, we lost a, a good percentage of our total wealth of, and of our infrastructure. For instance, we lost one out of every three hospitals, one out of every three schools, airport ports, dams, many, many things. So that was a second challenge, to reconstruct our country within our four-year presidential period. The third difficulty was that the Chilean economy, when we came to power, was losing its capacity to grow and create employment. And therefore, we had to change that very dramatically. Fortunately, things have gone according to what was planned. The only thing which was not planned, of course, was the earthquake. The Chilean economy is growing at the rate of close to 6% per year. We have been able to double our capacity to create jobs, and therefore we are very close to full employment. So the problem in Chile is not to find a job. The problem in Chile is to find a worker, which is a very different problem. Wages are going up very rapidly, and at the same time we have been able to reduce poverty, reduce inequality. So the country is moving, according to our view, in the right direction. But our target is that before the end of this decade, uh, Chile has become a developed country without poverty and with a more inclusive society, more equality of opportunity, and at the same time, more, uh, less income inequalities. And we are moving in that direction. If we keep growing at 5 to 6%, we will be able to achieve that goal by 2018, 2019. It means that we will achieve a per capita income of about $24,000, which is the difference, the threshold between the developed world and the developing world. Actually, there are many European countries like Greece, Portugal, and many others, which today are below that threshold of $24,000 in terms of per capita income. So that's the big challenge for us, to double our growth rate from 3 to 6% to double our capacity to create jobs and therefore be able, be, be able to tackle the, uh, the unemployment problem that we have, and at the same time reducing inequalities and defeating poverty. For that, of course, we have very powerful instruments. The first one, of course, is growth. Growth is a very powerful instrument because it creates opportunities, jobs, it provides fiscal revenue to fund all the social programs and the infrastructure program in which we are engaged right now. And that's the first, one of the first objective, but not the only one. The second objective is that we want this growth to really get to everybody. That's why we are so committed with reducing inequality, defeating poverty, and creating a society where everybody will have the guarantee of a life with dignity and at the same time the guarantee of having opportunity to really take advantage of all the talents that the people have. And for that, we are also undertaking very important reforms. One of them is the educational reform. We are fully aware that the old pillars of development are necessary but are not enough, are not sufficient. The old pillars were, was to have a stable democracy, an open market-oriented economy, and a modern state. That's not enough today in the society of information and knowledge. That's why we are trying to strengthen or build the new pillars of development. The first one is to do a major reform to increase the quality of our human capital. And therefore, we are putting not only our minds, our will, but also our resources into a very profound educational reform. For instance, we have been able to increase 
our public investment in education from $8.9 billion three years ago to more than $14 billion today. And that means that we're increasing not only coverage, uh, we, we had a very good coverage in terms of school education, but we had to increase the coverage in preschool education and increase the quality in every level. And we are undertaking that reform. We have put a lot of resources. We are spending almost 25% of our public expenditure in education. That was the first pillar that we had to build or strengthen. The second one was that we have to triple our investment in science and technology to be able to take advantage of all the opportunities of this new society of information and knowledge. And we are moving in that direction. Our investment in science and technology was close to 0.4%. We, we are very close to double that figure right now, but we have to triple it. The third new pillar that we are trying to build is to boost and promote innovation and entrepreneurship because those are the real renewal an inexhaustible resource that we can rely on. And we are doing a huge effort, not only to create one million jobs during our government period, which is equivalent to creating uh, 25 million jobs in the US in, a, in, a, in the same period, according to the size of the population. But at the same time, we are trying to promote and create more entrepreneurs. And we have been able, we have already created more than 800,000 new jobs and at the same time, 170,000 new entrepreneurs, which is a very important thing. And the fourth pillar that we have to build and strengthen is to get rid of poverty and to have a more inclusive society. That's why those are the, the priorities of the government that we are pushing very, very hard in order to be able to create these new pillars that will allow us to become a developed country without poverty and with a more inclusive society. But we also uh, are very committed with, with the integration to the world with free trade. That's why we have a free trade agreement with the US, which was signed in 2004, and with other 62 countries around the world, Canada, Mexico, the European community, Japan, China, India, Korea, Vietnam, Singapore, many others. So we, as a small country, in the far south of the world, isolated from the rest of the world by the driest deserts in the world, the biggest ocean in the world, the Pacific Ocean, the mighty Andes and the eternal ice in the south, we thought that for Chile the right uh, development strategy was to integrate itself to the world and we are doing that using all the means that we have at our disposal. That's why for us it's so important the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and that was one issue that was thoroughly discussed with President Obama because since we share the same views, we have a kind of alliance with the U.S. to work together in trying to make that project come to life and be able to benefit from the meaning of having the largest free trade zone in the world, which was, will be the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So, in terms of democracy, we also are trying to improve the quality of our democracy. That's why we change some rules, for instance, in order to allow five million people that were not registered in the, for the elections to be registered automatically. And we have a, a voluntary vote, and that means that we went from eight million people allowed to vote to 13 million people allowed to vote in the last three years. And we also established a system of primaries not equivalent to yours, because the, all the primaries happen in one day uh, all over the country, not like here that you have a long period for the primaries to take place. And therefore, I'm convinced that the Chilean economy or the Chilean society is moving in the right direction. We have a better, more a stronger, more transparent democracy. We have a healthier and uh, more robust economy, which is growing at 6%, creating jobs like never ever before. We are increasing salaries, reducing poverty. At the same time, we are taking these huge reforms in terms of education and health on one hand, and also this, the building of these new pillars. With respect, to, with respect to the relationship with the US, we have always had a very close and very friendly relationship with the US. That's why I think that Chile is part of the OECD. We have this free trade agreement with the US and with NAFTA. We have a strategic alliance 
with California and Massachusetts, and we are working there with the, the main university and the, and the state government in areas like education, energy, uh, science, technology, entrepreneurship, innovation, and we want to keep this relationship even stronger in the future. That's why this visit to the U.S., where we had the chance to talk to members of the Congress, to the, to the Secretary of State, Vice President, and President Obama, has been extremely useful for us because we are convinced that the only way in which Chile, which was the poorest Spanish colony and has already become the country with the highest per capita income in Latin America, uh, will be able to become a developed country, will be able to overcome underdevelopment, will be able to defeat poverty, will be able to strengthen its democracy, is by integrating, integrating ourselves to the world not only from an economic point of view, but also from a political point of view, a social point of view, a cultural point of view. And from that point of view, of course, the U.S. is uh, one of our main partners in terms of trade, in terms of investment, mm -hmm. in terms of collaboration. We were talking with President Obama about trilateral co cooperation mechanism, by which we join forces with the U.S. to help less developed countries. And we are already doing that in Central America, in South America, in, a, in Haiti, and in many other countries. And, that was one of the issues that were discussed with President Obama because both the U.S. and us want to strengthen and fortify those trilateral cooperation programs. So basically, what, what we are here, small country, but with a tremendous commitment to uh, become develop, a developed country, with a tremendous commitment with democracy, uh, freedom, rule of law, human rights, respect, separation of power, respect for, for freedom of press and freedom of expression, and all those values are very much shared by the, US, by the U.S. society and the U.S. people. That's why I would like to end these words by saying that even though we arrived late to the Industrial Revolution, and that's why we have been an underdeveloped country, we will not arrive late to this new revolution, which is much stronger and deeper than the old one, which is the revolution of this new society of uh, knowledge and, and information which is emerging in front of us and which will be extremely generous with those countries that really want to take advantage of all the opportunity that this new society implies, but will be indifferent or it could be even cruel with those countries that just want to let it go. So we made a, a very strong commitment of not making, or, uh, uh, again, the same mistake that we did when the Industrial Revolution uh, was there and we didn't realize it and we didn't, took, we didn't take advantage of it. This time we are fully committed with integrating ourselves to the world, competing with countries all over the world, and for doing that, of course, those new pillars that I was mentioning to you, education, science and technology, innovation and entrepreneurship, and a more inclusive society without poverty are key to, for our success in this big challenge, which is the mission of our generation. We are just celebrating 200 years of uh, independence. Uh, in your case, it's a little bit, bit more, but Chile is one of the oldest democracies in the world. I think that our parliament is the fourth or fifth oldest one in the world, and therefore this is the right moment when we are just celebrating our bicentennial to be able to say, of course with pride, but at the same time in a humble way, that we hope that Chile will be the first, hopefully not the only Latin American country able to achieve the goal of overcoming underdevelopment and defeating poverty. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, of course, came here right from the White House. T tell us a little bit about what progress you and President Obama made today on hammering out the details that are remaining in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Okay, our target is to reach an agreement before the end of the year, hopefully before the next APEC meeting, which will take place in October in Bali, Indonesia. We have made a huge progress 
But there are still some issues that will have to be discussed. The main issue that they will discuss with President Obama and also with Secretary Kerry and with, with his team are basically intellectual property, author's right, and uh, standards and legislation in terms of uh, labor and environment. Chile has very high standards in terms of labor legislation and environment legislation. So there we are really uh, moving ahead at the same speed that the US. But in terms of intellectual property and, and pharmaceutical products, there are some differences. So basically what we decided with President Obama is to, to work together in order to reach a consensus between the 11 countries and maybe in the future 12 countries, because Japan will probably join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And it won't be easy. It's never been easy, because there are different interests, different approaches, but we are confident, and this was something that we reassessed with President Obama, that if we work together with the US and with other countries like Australia and New Zealand, we will be able to reach an agreement in these new or these most more difficult topics like uh, labor, environment, and intellectual property. If Japan jo does join the group of countries in the talks, will that delay the completion of the talks? And what, how do you define completion? Does that mean a final product subject to congressional approval? And if not, what else would it mean? Well, of course that if Japan decides to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that will have an impact on timing. To say the opposite would be uh, very ingenious. But at the same time, they will have to, to accept or go along with most of the things that have already been approved. So it will take some more time, but I think it's worthwhile because Japan will add to the Trans-Pacific Partnership a very, a, 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 will make a huge contribution. They have had some problems with their agricultural sector, like in many other countries. But the agricultural sector in Japan represents less than 4% of their GMP. And therefore, when I had the, the opportunity to discuss this with the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, I remember that I was uh, telling him that Japan cannot be left out of this integration effort just because a small sector of their economy is opposing. And I think that they have made a lot of progress since then. And of course, we also have the problem with the US with the agricultural subsidies because what we want to have is free trade and fair trade. And therefore, we have to liberalize our economy, lower our tariffs, but at the same time, we cannot continue with such huge subsidy program as they exist in many, many countries. That's another issue that will have to be discussed. And with respect to what do I mean by accomplishment? Of course, accomplishment means that the system is working, and therefore, it's more than just to get an agreement between the 12 countries, because they, this agreement will have to be approved by the Congress in each and every of these countries. And here you have, in the US, two different ways to do it. One is the fast track authority, and the other one is a normal procedure. So we hope that the US will be able to use the fast track procedure because that will make it easier. In the other countries, we will have to approve this uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership according to our own rules and institutions. So accomplishment means that the system is working. We hope that we will reach the agreement before the end of this year, and we hope that during next year we will be able to approve this agreement in all the members' country. And there is, again, one rule that is being discussed, when this agreement will enter into action. Because one, one proposal is that when more than 50% of the GMP represented by all these countries uh, have signed the agreement. Other countries have different proposals for that. So this is an area that has not been agreed yet, and it's a very important one. What specifically does Chile want to gain out of the partnership? And where do you see access, market access improving the most for your country out of these uh, talks? Well, the truth is that Chile already has, has free trade agreement with each and every country which is part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, inclu including Japan. So from our point of view, the gains that we can obtain in terms of market access are not that big, 
So we are looking for a third generation agreement, not only free trade, but also to improve the quality of all the rules, rules of origins, how to resolve controversies, and how to expand this uh, agreement, not only to goods and services, but also to capital movement, uh, people movements. So we are looking for a, a, an agreement much more uh, deep and, and much more uh, wide than the typical free trade agreement that we have signed in the past. But it's true. And this is a discussion that we have in Chile. In Chile, many people think that since we already have agreement with all the countries, we're, there are not too much to gain. But I think there is a lot to gain. And besides that, Chile has a strong commitment with free trade. We started by reducing unilaterally our tariffs, then by signing bilateral free trade agreements, then by si signing multilateral agreements or with a community like the European communities. And therefore, we don't imagine a world with a TPP without Chile. What about specifically with the U.S.? Like you said, we've had a free trade agreement with Chile for nearly a decade already. What are you looking for to improve out of these talks with, between the U.S. and Chile mutually? Well, we still have some progress to be made in terms of liberalizing our markets and facilitating a free and fair trade. There are some areas where the U.S. has some restrictions particularly in the agricultural sector. So we would like to, of course, to expand our free trade agreement with the U.S. via the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But there are many other areas where we want to collaborate with the U.S. For instance, we are now collaborating much more than in the past in terms of uh, education. We are sending more than 3,000 Chilean students to study uh, masters or PhDs all over the world, more than one-third of them are coming to the U.S. and there are many U.S. students going to Chile. We have a lot to learn from you uh, in terms of your leadership in, in, in the areas of uh, energy, science, technology, and therefore we are also working. Right now, one of the largest or the largest solar plant in Latin America is being built in Chile by an American company which is called Sun Edison. At the same time, we are also working in these strategic alliances with California and Massachusetts, because there, we, there is a lot to gain mm, for us in terms of improving the quality of our education, the quality of our science and technology. We are bringing uh, research excellency centers from the U.S. To, to Chile, and many of them are already there. Right now, we are in the process of inviting, uh, and there are many American uh, research centers of a great prestige that are applying because it's a joint venture between the Chilean government and this research center. So if we think just about trade, maybe we have already accomplished much of it. But if we think about what it takes to become a better country, we still have a lot of areas where we can collaborate to the benefit of both countries between Chile and the U.S. How would you assess the Obama administration's overall relationship with Latin America? This questioner asks, is Obama taking a genuine interest in Latin America, or is the U.S. playing defense as China fosters ties in the region? Well, we understand that a country like the U.S. has many, many problems, challenges, and interests around the world. But we think that we have a special condition because we are part of the same continent. All of us are Americans. That's why when I heard the Bush initiative to create a free trade zone from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, Fireland, I thought that it was the right idea. Unfortunately, we have not made too much progress in that, in that direction. And I think that when President Obama visited Chile last year, he made a, a kind of speech or proposal to the whole Latin American world. And he was very committed in trying to recover the lost time in terms of uh, doing much more to integrate our, our Americas. Imagine Europe. They had to suffer two world wars, uh, but they were smart enough to move from the, from the Maginot line uh, philosophy to the Maastricht Agreement philosophy, which is instead of 
fighting themselves and kill themselves by millions, like they did in the 20th century, try to in, uh, create the economic union. Of course, they are facing some problems. Maybe they did it not in the right way. Maybe the creation of the, of the euro should have been accompanied by more fiscal and monetary coordination, and things like that, because we are fully aware of the programs, problems that they are facing right now. But we are convinced that the US has to play a much more active uh, and, and effective role, and it has to exert its leadership in, in its own continent, like uh, America, like the Americas, uh, in a much better way. And I have the impression that President Obama is fully aware of that. And uh, he should, and that's what he has told us, that's what he told us in Santiago, that uh, he will move forward. And there are some signs. For instance, now it's not only Chile that has a free trade, and Mexico, who has a free trade agreement with the US, also. Colombia, Costa Rica, Peru, and so I think that we are moving in the right direction. At the same time, we have to realize that there are some countries in Latin America that don't want to have a stronger relation with the U.S. On the contrary, they want to get rid of the U.S. or to get away from the U.S. So it's not an easy task. Part of the responsibility is on your side, the other part is in our side. You talked in your speech about the Pacific Alliance. Tell us, uh, what are the overall goals of the Pacific Alliance, and how will that differ from Mercosur, which you already have had for uh, some 15 years in that region? Well, the Pacific Alliance involved four countries, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile. We represent one third of the population, but we represent more than 55% of the total Latin American trade. Because the four countries are very open, what we have accomplished in less than one year, right now we have a free trade agreement that means that not more than 90% of our goods and services can flow between the countries with no tariff at all. And also we are eliminating non-tariff barriers. At the same time, what we want is to have a, an, a deep economic integration, which means free movement of goods, services, capital, people. And we are also working together, for instance, to integrate our financial sectors. We have created cooperation funds, and we have created a scholarship program to promote the interchange of students among these four countries. There are many countries that want to join the Pacific Alliance. Among them, I can mention Costa Rica, Panama. There are many countries that have already become observers of the Pacific Alliance, like France, Portugal, Spain, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. And even the U.S. has expressed their interest in becoming an observer member. So what we're trying to do is to move faster and get a, a move faster and uh, reach goals that without this coincidence in terms of principles and views would have been impossible. So all the efforts of integration that have been made in Latin America or in South America had not been as successful as the Pacific Alliance. And I think that the main reason for that is that we are able to reach agreement in a very easy way because we have the same approaches. We share the same values. We are not discussing democracy. We are not discussing a, a freedom of press. We are not discussing a separation of power. We are not discussing those things because we fully uh, agree with those basic principles. So what we, we are discussing is how to join forces to take advantage of all the opportunities that we are facing today. And the Pacific Alliance, which was born in Chile less than one year ago, is today a reality which has been, according to my view, extremely successful. And I think that the best fruits of the Pacific Alliance are yet to come. Your term is coming to a close early next year. Please give us your perspective on the upcoming presidential elections. Well, we, we still have more, nine more months. <laughs> and in nine months, we can do a lot of things, even a baby. <laughs> so we are not thinking yet about the next government. We're still thinking how to close successfully our government. But I will answer your question. But really, in three years, the results that we have been able to accomplish have been, from my point of view, very impressive. 
Chile was growing at 3%. Now we have doubled that rate. We have doubled our capacity to create jobs. We have a, a, a keep our inflation under control. The inflation rate last year was 1.5%. We have a balanced budget. We, we, we have a, 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 an important trade relation with the US. And by the way, the US has a very big surplus in its trade balance with Chile. I think we are one of the few countries in the world that can say that, and we don't care about that. So basically, we, we, we have been able to reduce poverty and to reduce inequality. And during the last government, poverty and inequality went up. So the change that the country experiences is very, very substantial. Of course, there are people that want more. You were telling me about protest from people in Magallanes, because they, of course, we, we are not a rich country in terms of uh, fossil fuels. We don't have enough gas or oil or coal. And the only gas and oil that we have, we have it in the southern part of the country. And of course, we are concerned that that situation might change in the future if we don't take care of those natural resources. And that's why we want to have rational, not only exploitation, but also a, an efficient consumption of gas. And that was part of the problem with the, with the southern region of Magallanes. With the students, we have almost, almost 6 million students in Chile. And of course, you will always find 50,000 that want to march and want to protest. And they are exercising their right because Chile is a free society and people have the right to protest and, and express their ideas and their proposals. The only problem with the march is that they have become very violent, at, particularly at the, at the end. Not because of the students, but at the end, we have to suffer a lot of destruction mm, in terms of private property, public property, and also lives. That's why we're trying to compatibilize freedom of uh, expression, and therefore they can march with uh, keeping public order in place. But, uh, there are, and, but and also there are some differences. For instance, we, they ask, they're asking for free education for everyone, and we think that we should guarantee free education to those people who really need it, but not for, to everybody, particularly not to the richest one, because they can afford that. And there's this difference that will have to be discussed democratically. But the way that we discuss and we make decisions in our democratic system is not who is jailing more in the streets. But we have a democratic system. Every four years, people can express their opinion. They can elect the government that, that they want. With respect to the next election that will take place by the end of this year, my impression is that the decision has not yet been made by the people. So it's an open election. There are some candidates that have the, the poll position. That's always true. But my impression is that it will be a tight election, and we don't know yet who is going to be the next president of Chile. On education, t tell us what you are doing to expand educational opportunities for the poor, and, and where do you draw the line between rich and poor? Well. As I mentioned before, we have put a huge priority and commitment in transforming our educational sector. Uh, we have already increased public investment in education by more than 50%. What are we doing with that money? First of all, we were very much aware that we didn't have a coverage problem in school education or in university education. It was a quality problem. And it was also a problem of uh, guaranteeing access to everybody with merit. But we did have a huge coverage problem in preschool education. So we made a commitment. We will guarantee free and mandatory preschool education to each and every child in Chile. And for that, we, will, we are doubling our capacity and we're increasing substantially the quality standards in terms of what kind of, of preschool education we will, be, we will be giving to to our boys and our children. And for that, we have changed all the standards. And we have put more professionals, more requirements. And at the same time, we have increased the public uh, finan funding of preschool education substantially. We, we will more than double our investment in preschool education, even though we know that those kids do not march, 
do not protest, do not vote, but we are fully convinced that that's where we can make the real difference. That's where we can really do a huge contribution to equality of opportunities. Because if we wait until they go to school at six years old, many times the vulnerabilities of the homes are, might become irreversible. That's why we're putting a lot of effort in coverage and quality of preschool education. In terms of school education, we already had coverage that was uh, above 95 percent, so we're just in increasing that a little bit, but we are doing a huge effort in increasing the quality of our school education. For instance, we are trying to attract the best students to study and to become the professors of our children in the future, and therefore we are uh, uh, giving a lot of uh, incentives. Hmm? For instance, if you are a good student and you decide to to study to become a teacher, you get your uh, I mean you get a scholarship that will means that that your education is absolutely free. And if you are even better than that, you will get a scholarship to go to some uh, other country. M many of them are coming to the U.S. or to Europe to study for a semester, things like that, to improve the quality of our teachers, which is a key aspect. Another thing that we are doing, of course, is that we are trying to evaluate our teacher according to performance, and not only according to age. And that's something which is very difficult, because normally they progress according to age. We are trying to introduce these performance uh, tests in order to uh, incentivate more those people who are doing a better job. That's something which is important in school education. In university education, we want to guarantee to all the students belonging to the 60% of the most vulnerable uh, homes uh, the right to have a scholarship. And therefore, the scholarship will pay for the higher, for the university education. And we have said, and we are doing that. We, are, we as a government, we guarantee if you belong to a family which is part of the 60% of the most vulnerable family in Chile, the, you, and you have the merit, you have the right to get a scholarship funded by the government. And for the 30% which come next, we have established a, a loan system, very subsidized loan system. Actually, I would say that it's better than yours because the interest rate is 2%, which is one third or maybe one fourth or what should have been if it was according to market rates. You don't pay more than 10% of your income, so it's contingent to your income. You pay whatever is a quota, but never more than 10% of your income. And after 15 years, whatever debt is left, it's over, because you will be uh, committed to pay your loan only for 15 years. And therefore, we have 90% of the Chilean students or students belonging to the 90% of the most vulnerable or middle class uh, families in Chile that have guarantee access to a scholarship of a loan system. So th there is only the 10%, the most rich, uh, or the richest 10% of the population that they have to fund of, uh, for the education by, with, with their own resources. That's the system that we have. And that means that we have had to, of course, to increase the number of scholarships. We have tripled the number of scholarship in the last three years. So basically, that's our approach. Even though this is a very generous, I think, system, there are some people that have different ideas. The, our discussion with, the, with some of the students, because we, we shouldn't confuse these students with those students that are protesting, is that they want free education for everybody. And we think that's not fair, and we think that we cannot afford it. Of course, we have free education at preschool and school level for everybody. We're talking about university education. And we say, look, we will help those who really need it with scholarship or with loan, depending on their situation. And the second discussion is that whether we should have a mixed system where both private and public institutions are participating at all levels of our educational sector. We think that that's the right solution, to have private and public institution, and the government is responsible for the quality of all these institutions, at the same time to provide the funds in order to have free preschool and school education, but the students or the parents, according to our views, have the right to choose. So we don't believe in a government monopolizing the educational sector in every level, at all times, 
And that's another difference with the students. So we have this discussion, which is normal in a democratic society. The important thing is that we have to make decisions according to our democratic system and not according to who is able to yell or be born violent in the streets. On a different topic, Chilean poet Pablo Neruda's body has been exhumed to determine whether he was poisoned as a result of his opposition to Pinochet. Can you tell us more about this investigation and the questioner asked whether the results of the investigation might have any sort of impact on the election? Well, there has been the same question uh, in the past about Allende, for instance, and, and there was an investigation and it came out to the conclusion that he committed suicide as was the, the, the theory of, the, of his family, the government, and everybody. Now there is this doubt, and therefore the judiciary power in Chile uh, has determined to undertake an investigation which is uh, in course. So we'll see what the results are, even though he, was, he died in 1973, so more than 40 years ago. Who knows? I cannot. I cannot guarantee you what was the real cause of death of our Nobel Prize, Pablo Neruda. But at the same time, I can tell you that there are no good, there are no strong evidence hmm, about any kind of plot or assassination. But if somebody wants to find out, and our judiciary power, which is absolutely independent, decided that they would undertake an investigation which is in, 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 in process right now. Your presidency, of course, will be remembered for the rescue of the 33 miners. Uh, the accident at the time, of course, exposed some safety concerns about mining in the country and probably in other places as well. Tell us what your administration has done to improve safety in that industry since then. Well, I remember that episode with a lot of emotions because it was a huge accident. Huh? Suddenly we realized, or we were informed that 33 miners were caught in a mine, small mine, in the driest desert of the world, which is the Atacama Desert, more than 2,000 feet below the earth. I remember that I was in Colombia at that time because uh, President Santos was uh, having his in inauguration ceremony. And I decided to come back immediately to Chile. And when I arrived to Chile, many people told me, don't go there because there is no way that we will be able to find them and there is no way that we will be able to rescue them because the accident had been so terrible. I decided to go there that night and I remember that I met with the wives, mothers, daughters, sons, and they were desperate because at that time we didn't know anything. We didn't know where they were. We didn't know whether they were dead or alive. And I remember that I made a commitment to them. I said, look, the only commitment I can make to you is that we will look for them as if they were our own sons. We will do whatever is possible to find them and to rescue them safe and alive. And we did it. We did exactly that. We start uh, doing everything that was uh, useful and necessary to find them. And it took us almost three weeks to find them. And finally, we knew that they were alive, all of them. And then we had to face the second challenge, which was to rescue them. It was extremely difficult. Something like that has never been done before in the world. So we asked for help from many countries. And we are very grateful with the US because the US was very helpful in providing us equipment and technology. And after almost three months, we finally were able to rescue each and every one of them alive and safe. So for us, it was something very emotional and very important because it was not just the question of, of rescuing minors. It was a question of our commitment to life. Our commitment with the life of those 33 minors was a commitment with the life and the quality of life of each and every Chilean. And we were very uh, motivated because the whole country rallied behind this uh, this uh, challenge and the whole world at the given point in time. Since then, of course, we have taken a lot of measures 
to improve the quality and security of uh, working conditions of our workers. And uh, we have been able to, to reduce by half the number of uh, accidents that we are having in the mining sector and reducing by half the number of, death, of life lost because of mining accidents. And we have done, I mean, this is, we have done many things, but the most important thing is that we have established a standard of security for all companies, and each and every company has to, to be responsible for their own security. So they have to fulfill a, a, a kind of checking a list plan about, and, and therefore assess, and how to evaluate themselves about how the security is, and workers are participating in this process. And therefore, we have been able to, to identify a lot of areas where security measures were not enough. And we have, of course, improved our standards. And we have standards which are equivalent to an OECD country right now, because that's our model. The OECD countries, one of them is the US. We are almost out of time. But before asking the last question, I have a couple of housekeeping matters to take care of. First of all, I'd like to remind you of our upcoming lunch and speakers. Tomorrow on June, 1st, for June 5th, we have U.S. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack. On July 1st, we have Carly Fiorina, the former CEO of Hewlett Packard, who currently serves as the chairman of Good360. And on August 8th, we will have Jim Rogers, the CEO of Duke Energy. Second, I would like to present our guest with the traditional National Press Club coffee mug. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm pleased. Say hello to Tom and Carly on my behalf because they are very good friends of mine. Wonderful. Suitable, of course, for drinking Chilean wine as well. <laughs> and for our final question, we began by mentioning your, um, the fact that you're a helicopter pilot and that you like to fly helicopters. Tell us, um, is that something you're looking forward to doing more of once you're uh, out of office? Well, I think that to fly has been a human dream since the very beginning. Remember the Greek stories about Icaro, hmm, that he wanted to, huh? Icaro and Dedalo, that they wanted to fly to, huh? and somebody told them, don't get too close to the sun, and don't get too close to the ocean, but they didn't obey that, and it was a disaster. That <laughs> happened 4,000 years ago. It took almost 4,000 years hmm, uh, to get to the right, to the right brothers. Hmm? Or, or it took 4,000 years to get to Leonardo da Vinci, and he was the first one who started acting as an engineer or an architect and planning how to fly, and it took 400 years since then for the Wright brothers to have the first fly, even though there are many people think that other people flew before them. But you know the winners uh, write the story. <laughs> and I think that all the time, we, at least in my case, I mean, to fly has been always my dream, and therefore, when I had a chance to, and this was uh, eight years ago, to, to become a pilot, I took it immediately. And uh, even though I'm president, and this is something that I would like you to keep it right here, hmm? <laughs> I'm still flying <laughs> for a very simple reason. If I don't fly, I don't accumulate hours, and I will lose my license. <laughs> and to get my license back will be very difficult. And one story which was very funny because in Chile, just like in the US, you cannot fly over the White House. So I was flying in, in, the, in the direction of our White House and I was called by the, con, the traffic controller and said, look, you cannot go there. Why, I said, because uh, that's the president house. And why do we have this rule? Because we want to protect the president. Well, I'm the president, I said. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming today. We really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank our National Press Club staff, including its Bro Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center for helping organize today's event. Finally, here's a reminder that you can find more information about the National Press Club online. And if you would like a copy of today's program, you can also find that on our website at www.press.org. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>